from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me Ian joining me from the UK, from London. Ian, thank you very much for you know, being on the show today. The way, as I was explaining to you what I like to do, I keep it to my guests to introduce themselves and what they are uh, up to. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mehmet. It's great to be here. Lovely to meet you. Um, so I'm Ian. I'm the Chief Technology Officer and Head of Data Science for Adludio. Uh, we're a global business that's really focused on the use of AI to build and optimize um, mobile ads, particularly mobile, but for any format. Um, my background is computer science, 25 years in the ad tech industry, 10 years at WPP, 10 years running the data science practice for publicists globally. Um, I also had a spell consulting side with Taz Watson, but I, again, all in the area of technology. And most recently for the last five to seven years, um, technology is really focused on building and delivering applications that use various forms of artificial intelligence. Um, Great. Great. I'm a family man. I have four, four grown up children. So my wife and I, our life is, there's a greater degree of freedom than ever now, which is nice. So that's, that's me. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. I am, and I'm um, again, very pleased to have you today. So. Actually, you know, I covered a lot of topics, uh, you know, related to tech on the show. Um, I never had, you know, someone from your, uh, I would say, line of business, which is the ad tech. So the first thing, mm -hmm. you know, on a high level, if you can explain me, you know, and of course, like we can go hours, I know on this, but at least on a high level, what is ad tech is all about, right? So for someone who, who might be interested. And exactly what you at yeah. at the, you you do, if you can explain me this. Yes, of course. I mean the ad, the ad tech industry is is huge um, and involves essentially any technology that um, revolves around the communication with a consumer or a business. That's that's ad tech. So in many respects, um, a lot of the revenue that um, the likes of Google and Facebook are generating you could say is, is essentially ad tech. They're using their data and their technology platform to provide services to brands primarily um, to drive and or to, to develop relationships with their consumers, um, to understand their needs and to communicate with them in, in ways that are meaningful and, and not, not intrusive. Um, so that's, that's the ad tech industry in a nutshell. It's, there's, there are thousands of ad tech vendors uh, there are many, many different specialists, everything from content um, to search to campaign management um, to the kind of work that we do. And we're very focused on the uh, the creative process. So very much known for very high quality, very high speed uh, mobile creative. Um, mm -hmm. Adludio has been operating for nearly nine years. So we have a lot of historic data about how how to engage a, a consumer. And more recently, our, our technology platform has evolved significantly to include many different forms of AI to understand what really makes up a high quality um, mobile ad. And that includes things like gamification. So a lot of our ads are highly gamified in nature. And we also use um, machine learning and computer vision techniques to understand what's the best um, combination of game sequences and creative objects to engage a particular audience for a given brand, whether it's financial services or, or luxury or automotive, what's the best way to really engage an audience and, and can we optimize the, 
structure and the um, creative objects within that ad in real time. Great. Thank you very much for this explanation, Ian. Now you mentioned a couple of things that I want to like a little bit dig more into that. So AI, you know, when we say AI people, it's the buzzword now, everyone talks about it. But yeah. if, uh, you know, like, especially, you know, because AI depends a lot, it's, it's machine learning at the end of the day, and you need to be collecting mm. a lot of data. So now, first, I want to understand, like you, you mentioned about gamification and all this and create and the creative side of it. But what, mm. you know, can, can, can you describe like more um, the role of the AI in, in the whole, I would say, advertising ecosystem in, in general? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you use our platform as, as, a, as an example, we're applying AI to every part of the campaign cycle. So it starts with the, so if it's our managed service offering, which is our um, delivery of mobile creative to agencies for their clients, that's our managed service offering. But we also um, deliver solutions to resellers and direct to brands. But the process for managed service begins with the briefing process. So what is the client trying to do? What audience are they trying to reach? What's the product offering? Um, and we use natural language. We use large language models. So, I mean, that's the technique that's been used, that underpins ChatGPT, for example. But we're mm -hmm. customizing those kinds of very large models for to understand the briefing process. So the more an agency tells us about what their client is trying to achieve, the more our platform understands about what, how it needs to optimize um, a mobile ad. The next part of the process is a bidding for digital publisher and inventory in, in real time. That's how digital media works. There's a, mm -hmm. an online auction process and we use algorithms to optimize the bid. The next stage is um, using uh, techniques like computer vision and neural nets to understand What's the best combination of creative objects? Do we use human beings? Do we not use human beings? Do we, what kind of color do we use in the foreground and background? What kind of text do we use? Where does the call to action button need to be? What kind of call to action button? And what's the combination of those creative objects and game sequences? What's the best way to engage, a, say, a financial services brand in France or a luxury goods um, consumer in in the US and our platform understands each of those factors and the combinations mm -hmm. of those and it uses that data to optimize the next time it sees a campaign that, that appears to have the same kind of profile or the same kind of um, brief. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a number of other machine learning text techniques as well for things like pacing and um, forecasting. So. Is there, what are we trying to achieve and have we achieved it? And where are the variances? Um, and we also score publisher and uh, inventory in the same way that we would score a mobile ad. So what's the fit between the mobile creative and the publisher um, and where it appears? And is there a good, good or bad fit between them creatively? Mm -hmm. So like this is, we, we talked about, you know, the, uh, what's under the hood, I would say. Now, one thing when it comes to specifically, you know, uh, anything that directly relates to the customer uh, is, and again, you have AI, you have data. So mm. the issues of transparency and ethics, right? So mm -hmm. how, how like, do you address these issues uh, in, in, in advertising uh, yeah. technology? I mean, obviously, you know, yeah. Yeah. So just, I want to yeah. know, like, how do you handle this? And okay, because you are on the technical side, but at the same time, you know, like we, we are all, all responsible for, for the, you know, these things as well as uh, tech executives. Yeah, yeah, obviously. And, and obviously we're all consumers at the end of the day. So privacy, GDPR, information security are, are very important topics now. And with such a focus on AI. There has to be a balance between the power that AI can bring and the privacy that, um, the protection that we need to give to consumers and, and to, to businesses for that matter. Our, our particular solution is, is not, um, cookie based and therefore doesn't use personal data. Our, our focus is very much on engaging the consumer with a highly engaging ad unit that's that where AI has 
has been used in many forms to build that mm -hmm. ad unit in, in real time. So we don't process personal data um, at all. And um, if there's any personal data being used, it's the data that belongs to the client. And therefore, they are responsible for um, the gathering and um, storage and security of that, of that data. Um, because bear in mind that a lot of the activity that we do is pushing a campaign into um, DSPs, which is the, trade, the trading platforms for digital media. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, like the data is, is the client responsibility, but just out of curiosity, are you hearing from, from your clients that they are now having difficulties in, in uh, getting data because, you know, everything that happened from, you know, the, the cookie side. I know that you don't do it yourself, but you clients have to mm. rely on that. And plus, yes. you know, like many tech giants, like for example, Apple started to implement like more, um, mm. I would say aggressive policies to, to avoid having the data be handled to, to third parties. So what are you seeing in this domain, Ian? Um, obviously the, the cookies are disappearing as I said, cookies will no longer be, um, available to marketers and to advertisers. That's, um, that's a process that's been going on for some time. Uh, and Apple, Apple's limitations, uh, or restrictions around cookies in Safari was, is a big event. Google are taking a, uh, and obviously a huge amount of digital traffic is through, um, Google systems along with Facebook. Um. Google have said that their, um, the removal of cookies will happen sometime during the summer of 2024. And they've made a number of moves in, in that direction. And that means that advertisers that are making heavy users of any technology, um, are seeing the cookie disappear as a mechanism to track effectiveness. Now that then means that they've got to find different methods to track effect effectiveness of their advertising. Um, Advertising spend for any brand is, is a huge investment. It's a huge part of the balance sheet. And therefore, to optimize that, you need um, methods for tracking, which means you've got to, cons you've got to communicate directly with the consumer um, and have the uh, explicit permission to collect, store, and utilize their data for ongoing marketing and to use that data to create what we call an ID, which is identifies an individual across devices and, and says, Mehmet's on his connected TV, he's on it, uh, what looks like a mobile device and a browser. Therefore, we think it's the same person. We attach an ID to that individual, but we need your explicit permission to communicate with you, to send you outbound messages and to use your data and any data where you belong to the same segment. So individuals that have a similar profile to you, we have to have your permission. And that, that's the, the challenge that's facing advertisers right now is that trade-off between optimizing spend and protecting the privacy and security of the consumer. Mm -hmm. Now, this is also that at the end of the day, still with the, um, you know, consent, let's say of, of the consumer, uh, data mm. should be handled. So in your opinion, who should control? the consumer data and how you see this, uh, changing with the, with all, you know, what's happening currently. Yeah. I mean, the issue of control is a, is a, is a complex one. I mean, primarily the relationship is between the consumer and a, and a brand. So the, the brand has responsibility to, to protect their data. And obviously we're, we're all familiar with, you know, various data breaches that have occurred, uh, in recent years. So there, there are huge. There are a lot of technical challenges with making sure that that personal data is secure for a start. Um, so I think brands um, have a, a the first um, um, responsibility for for managing data to in a, in a personal data in a responsible way. But then you cannot ignore the huge uh, where you know a huge proportion of their revenue is coming through advertising and the use of data. So what we call the walled gardens, the like of um, Facebook, Google data passing through their systems. 
And I think the tech companies probably should do more um, to protect privacy. Um, in many cases, the big tech companies have been brought to the table by regulators in the EU and in the US. The EU, for example, the European Union has been very strict on uh, data protection and privacy right. legislation. Um, that's only going to increase as AI um, starts to take hold in advertising, which it is already, no question. And that creates mm. even bigger challenges about security and um, privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, like you mentioned, I had a couple of, like, let's call them trends, right? So that are happening in, in, in this space, mainly AI, mm. right? So what, what other trends mm. are you seeing happening? Because, I, you know, from what I'm hearing and, you know, a couple of um, discussions with, with, with friends offline on, on this topic. So they are saying like the ad tech industry is, is on the verge of a major transformation. Now, mm. when I try to understand more, I hear mixed opinions. So mm. I'm, I'm curious as <laughs> I was explaining to you. So what are the trends what kind that of, we, we, we might see? <laughs> okay. What kind of transformation do you, are you hearing? Just, just out of interest. Yeah, and like some people go to very extremist and say like maybe the whole, you know, way we do advertisement as we do it today on the internet might change and this would go to mm -hmm. something completely different, you know, like we're going to go all, yeah. all, all way with, you know, something like metaverse, VR, you know, these kinds of things. And sometimes mm -hmm. we hear people, they say, mm -hmm. no, like this is something here to stay. Although like with all the changes and regulations that comes in, still big brands would have, you know, the power to, to you know, navigate, let's say, the regulation. So, so I, I'm hearing, you know, yes. opinions from two different, uh, uh, I would say, sides. And each one is like interesting discussions, I would say. So, but from someone like you, I am like, who's inside this, I would say, I would, <laughs> I would hear something more accurate. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think we have to accept that AI is going to transform advertising and ad tech for sure. And it, and it already is on the, on the generative um, front, but we can come back to AI. Um, elsewhere, th there's no doubt that Web3, uh, as an always on high speed, very interactive, highly personalized technology, will change advertising. I think the metaverse, uh, so augmented reality and, um, and techniques like that, will st uh, steadily increase in sophistication and in relevance to the consumer. But there are some major barriers, such as the cost of devices and headsets and whether we really want to spend lengthy periods of time um, with, a, with a headset. I, I have my doubts about that. Um, I think for certain segments, for certain parts of the population, so gamers, for example, are very used to in-game advertising and in-app advertising. Um, I think... What it does, what all of those trends mean is a massive opportunity for advertisers, both an opportunity and a challenge, to decide where do they invest? Do they do this in-house or do they invest with technology partners? And if they choose to invest with technology partners, are they losing the insight that is actually necessary to drive, to grow their, their brand and to build lasting relationships or not? I think for what you would class as the traditional ad tech providers, the likes of Google, it, again, facing major challenges. You can see that uh, Meta have chosen to, you know, entirely rebrand as Meta and to put billions into the Metaverse as a chosen strategy. But we're yet mm -hmm. to really see um, a significant payback from Meta's Metaverse uh, investment. Google, with their investment in things like DeepMind, is, is choosing to add AI to its ad tech platforms uh, and, and the likes of YouTube, for example. Um, so they are taking a, a somewhat different approach. And then you've got other more recent entrants in the large scale um, technology companies like Amazon, right? their, own, their own DSP, and obviously have a lot of data about your shopping habits. And... As long as it is back to the earlier point about privacy, if Amazon are able to leverage the data asset that they have, um, they are in a very powerful position. Um, because in the end, the purpose of advertising is that you buy, buy more. And obviously, right. Amazon knows an awful lot about what you buy and when 
and your views and your feedback and, and so on. Um, so they're, they're in an interesting position if they can leverage it. And they have their cloud computing, you know, AWS expertise as well. So they have the horsepower and they have the data. The question is where, where their, how their strategy develops in the ad tech field. Mm -hmm. Are we going to see any consolidation in the ad tech uh, space? I am. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Lots. I think a lot of the small to medium sized companies, um, will struggle to survive because of the investment that's required to maintain, um, a viable solution in the, in the face of huge competition that were, that have very deep pockets, you know, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, these are hugely cash rich biz businesses that can afford to invest and they do huge, huge, um, percentages of their income into R and D. Um, and they can afford to, um, invest in areas that do develop and invest in areas in some cases where they don't develop and they can afford to take that risk. So the smaller to medium sized companies are going to struggle to find the investment and they're going to have to find niches in the ad tech space, whether it's content or relationship management or, um, automated design or whatever it might be. They're going to have to find the niches that where they can compete. Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to the AI point, and you know, by the time we 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 broadcast this to the air, it will be maybe two weeks time from now. But just today, mm -hmm. this morning, I've seen uh, you know the news from OpenAI that they're going to start to to see and being able to yeah. able to take images and and you know you chat with it based on the image. The reason I'm asking you yeah. is fine. From Ad perspective, like, do you think now any company that is in AI space has the capability to become an ad tech company? Uh, uh, yes, um, up to a point. Um, the beauty of, of chat GPT, particularly G GPT-4, is the sheer amount of data that, that the models have been trained on. And that's why they're called large language models. Um, for most tech companies, there's not, there's not a great deal of point in trying to replicate the scale of data that these things have been trained on. Um, in open AI's case, it's, it's a little bit different for images. They're still training their models, um, for image detection and, um, production. And you could say that voice is actually relatively easy once you've, once you've solved for the text. It's actually relatively easy to put voice on, on top of a platform like that. Now that means as a technology asset, hugely powerful to any, any business that's looking to, to develop what you could call ad tech capabilities. So we use chat GPT's, uh, APIs for, for text and we customize their APIs for, um, specifically for the briefing part of our, um, technology. Because there's no point in us replicating the, the text mining capability that something like uh, chat right. GPT has. And the same thing for DALL-E 3 on um, for, uh, images. Um, but the interesting thing is that there's now a, there's, there's a hundred, um, applications out there that will generate an image, you know, what we call or text, yeah. and you can generate, you can generate a film or a photo or a piece of text. Um. So that's the generative AI phenomenon that we've seen over the last year or so. That's going to continue. Absolutely no question about that. But my view as a technologist is that that is, is, not, is not particularly clever. You can randomly generate a set of images as long as you've trained your model adequately on um, historic data. What's really meaningful is which image do you actually need for the application that you want to put it to? And how do you decide? which image is, is most relevant. And that means understanding the data that's connected to a combination of images. That's far more interesting. It's far more challenging and is definitely the way the ad tech industry will, will progress. So, um, the, the question I was asking you, Ian, is when you talked about using AI for generating, um, 
add text, images, and even we saw video. Mm. Now, mm. some some experts say that, like, how much creative can AI be here? Because actually, we are using, and all of this generated data, and we're just you know given to a to an algorithm mm. to re repurpose it in a different way. Uh, is it true? Mm -hmm. Like AI, AI will, you know, because we are some people, they, they, it's a very famous saying now, if, if you tank with garbage, it will give you garbage. But I don't think we give it mm -hmm. only garbage. And I think we give some no. really creative things. But how, how far do you think AI can be really creative when, when it generates, like, let's say, full blown, a, uh, you know, a, a marketing campaign, including, you know, scripts? image selection mm -hmm. and video. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the answer to that question is there's, there's no question that, um, AI can be used to deliver the entire campaign cycle and all its associated content across all channels, as long as the, the channels are connected and the, and the return path data goes back to the underlying algorithm. Um, what's needed is, is technical integration of different media channels for a start, which means all the data that a set of models might see are integrated at some point and that those m models, um, include machine learning in some form or techniques like what we call reinforcement learning. That means we're inf effectively rewarding a model for its ability to achieve a, a certain result. Um, and we use neural nets for, uh, for the same purpose and it's actually the same technique that tesla is using for um driverless cars for their fsd version 12 is a neural network that's learning about the data that it's um it's receiving in real time processing that in real time to enable a car to make decisions and really what we're talking about here is 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 very much the same technique but being applied for a completely different application um, so no doubt in my mind that over time we will see, um, the script, the content variations of that content, um, being generated in real time with increasing levels of relevance to the consumer, um, and machine learning effectively taking over, um, large parts of the, uh, production cycle in for, for advertising where, where there are some limitations is. You do see instances where creative agencies invent a, a crazy idea for a campaign that um, somehow resonates with an audience. And that's, that's probably the most interesting area. At what point do computer vision algorithms learn really, really innovative um, concepts, let's call them that, for campaigns that um, where it's not been exposed to that kind of data in, in the past, that's the, that's the tipping point that we're not really seeing yet, but it, it will come and it's neural networks that will really drive that. How long do you think it would take us until we release this? Like, or let me, if I want to rephrase the question, like how this space would look like in, in mm. after, let's say. I don't want to say five years because you have to like you say five is too long. Let's say in three years or two too years. Long. Time. Yeah. I think in, in two to three years, we'll certainly see a number of campaigns that have been in entirely automated and have been proven to be faster and more relevant to a given audience. Well, we will certainly see that. And I mean, every single aspect of the campaign and end to end, including just multimedia um, delivery across media channels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, like you mentioned something about, you know, cloud and spendings, and maybe it's, you know, as a CTO as well, you might uh, mm -hmm. give us some insights. So when are you seeing, you know, the, the, the technology spendings heading, you know, in the near and long future? I mean, most organizations, including ours. Um, are not processing data on premise any longer. It's cloud based. Um, there are organizations that run on premise, you know, the highly regulated industries, for example, may mm -hmm. run on, pre on premise databases and 
um, cloud-based infrastructure. We are in, entirely cloud-based ourselves. We use AWS. We're not multi-cloud. There are some organizations that are, are multi-cloud. There are some ad tech providers that have to be multi-cloud um, because there are some, some brands that will say, well, we don't want our data going through Amazon because we're a retailer, so we don't, we don't want to see our data going through AWS or we don't want to see our data going through Google's platform. So therefore you do see ad tech companies that are multi-cloud. So they'll have Azure, AWS and Google cloud. Um, so that's mm -hmm. increasing. Um, yeah. but it's one, it's one of the reasons that's one of the things that's fueled AI in the last year or two is the compute horsepower has increased exponentially and the cost of that horsepower has, has dropped significantly. And that means the amount of data that we can process cost effectively has increased significantly. And that's an absolutely crucial aspect of the growth in, in AI is compute horsepower and the cost of that processing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, out of curiosity, how much is important, especially for at the companies to invest in solutions like data analytics and, you know, these kinds of, of solution and data mining maybe also. Oh, it's, it's essential. And it's, it's, um, in technology these days, the, um, the best career path is data science. So data engineering, um, data science, machine learning ops are huge growth areas in terms of career development. So, you know, brands have to invest in data science as a discipline. Ad tech companies obviously rely on, on data science as a discipline, so they have to invest in those, in those skills. Um, I think the interesting question for brands is how much of that expertise do they, um, add in house or how much do they rely on partners? And mm -hmm. I think for the lar large agencies out there, they're at a real tipping point. AI is, is going to continue to cause them some, uh, um, strategic pain, let's call it that, um, where they've not really, the large agency networks have not really invested in data science as a discipline. And the knock-on effect of that is that they've not been developing the repositories of data that they can then apply to AI going forward. They've been somewhat left behind. Yeah. Um, you know, as we, we are coming to, to, to the end just now. I target CTOs and I target also, you know, to be founders or uh, like new founders, let's say, uh, from your experience, mm -hmm. I am like, you, you, you've been in, in this for, for a long time. Um, yeah. what, what advice you can give for someone first who's interested in your niche, which is the uh, ad tech, you know, like what are the things mm -hmm. that they should care about when, when they are building their startups and second, you know, general advice for any, uh, you know, the tech, uh, technical founder who was just starting his, his uh, venture or just starting his career. Yeah. I mean, for, for startups, if you mean a startup, that's going to have some kind of, um, technology product, then yeah. they've got to be very clear about the niche that they're, they're trying to address and not assume that they can cope with huge technology companies that have much bigger budgets. Um, and then they need to be very clear about what their go-to-market strategy is. How are they going to reach the audience for their, their chosen product? And, and most, um, technology startups completely fail at this. They misunderstand the niche and then they don't adequately understand how to take their product to market in a very efficient way. In terms of individuals starting out, then if, if it's the technology career path, then yeah. absolutely learn things like go open source, learn things like TensorFlow and um, uh, Python, things like PyTorch. Um, but also things like prompt engineering is going to be a major area of growth in the technology space over the next year or two. How do you configure prompt-based systems to up to provide intelligent answers to very complex questions. So we call that prompt engineering. It's a, it's a big growth area. Um, but make sure that you've got a solid grounding in maths and statistics. Some of these are 
the underlying equations in AI, some of them are quite complex. So an underlining um, grounding in, in maths is, is, a, is a, well, statistics is a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. But it's open, open source uh, Python and Spark are the you know, leading tools that they should really acquire if they want a, a technical career path. Mm -hmm. And I would also say to the marketing, um, marketing professionals, I've got to learn much more about the technologies, the data, the strengths and weaknesses of various technologies. They've got to have a, a far better understanding of these things if they are uh, a non-technical um, decision maker in a in a brand or a an advertising agency. Yeah, they have a lot actually. To yeah, please go ahead. I... No, I'm just gonna say they have a lot to learn, in my view. Ah, uh, yeah. So, uh, like one thing, um, maybe we repeated on the show too much, also as well to your point. Like every company now needs to be a data driven company. Um, and you know, this is applies not only for, let's say the mm. IT or the, or the technical folks, it applies to every department in the organization so they can, you know, take better decisions. They can, you know, understand what's happening. They can understand their customers. Uh, I'm, I'm mm. not sure, like, did I miss to ask you anything? Like this is, <laughs> it's not a tricky question, but really, is there anything that you wish that I had asked you? That's a, that's, that's actually quite a good question. It's a nice open question. I don't <laughs> think so. No, you, you've asked a very broad range of questions. Um, no, I, I can't think of anything that you haven't, you haven't asked me that I thought you might. Okay. You, what, you're, yeah, obviously, so you're, you're, <laughs> you're obviously good at it. I, I'll turn, you know, one, one guest sir, that I'm doing a trick. You know, and Kai said, no, I'm not doing no. it like, really because, because sometimes, you know, um, I do the show daily. So of course yeah. I take my notes. I have the question that I prepared, you know, but we are human beings and maybe I have missed something down the road. So just to make sure that maybe an idea that you wanted to highlight, I mean, for the guests, so they can have this window, let's say to, to share this, but anyway, thank you very much. Ian. I, I. I really enjoyed this. I learned a lot about EdTech today from you and, you know, some of the uh, things that we are expecting to see in the future. So thank you very much for uh, enlightening right. us uh, around this. And um, right. of course, it's like, great uh, same here. And of course, like, uh, you know, it's always good. Yeah. Uh, so it's, so it's, it's, it's good. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much for tuning in and uh, thank you, Ian, again for joining me today. And as usual, this is how I end up my episode. Uh, please, if you have any say, any questions, any feedback, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And uh, thank Thanks. you very much for tuning in. We'll meet you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Hit that subscribe button. Share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.